school administrators association, the school superintendents association, the, the school teachers union, they were all in this group. We got called before them and they wanted to know what our case was. And so it was totally Daniel in the lion's den. And I'm, I'm in this room filled with people and I'm on the hot seat. Welcome to Classical Etc., a show that dives into the philosophy, culture, and heart of classical education. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Memoria Press podcast. Today, I had the absolute pleasure of sitting down with Martin Cothran, who was a lobbyist for classical education during the 90s. And he shared some war stories from his battles for classical education that were astounding and a pleasure to listen to. So here's our conversation. All right, so you mentioned in a previous episode um, that there was a period in time in the 90s where you became really a spokesman for real education in the state of Kentucky. And I'm interested in that story. Um, how did that come about? How was Mrs. Lowe involved? Um, what was going on at that point? Yeah, well, um, our state had uh, had, had a, a court case was filed. It had to do with uh, the inequitable distribution of of tax money in different districts. You have poor schools, and they didn't get as much, as much money as big schools, and, which was a legitimate issue. But then uh, in a very active court decision, they basically struck our whole system of education down, <laughs> which, uh, and this was all planned. There, there, We found out later that there were people involved in this who wanted to change it in a certain way. And so a little bit of conspiratorial there, you know. Um, and so, uh, so these people came in, and uh, they... Um, I would go to some of the talks that these people would give about what they're going to do with education in Kentucky. And we're not, we're not so concerned with knowledge, we're, but we're concerned uh, how you use knowledge. And I'm sitting there forming questions in my mind, wait a minute, well, if you don't have any knowledge, then how, how can you use it? Um, that sort of thing. And so uh, the legislature passed this, it was, it was the, it passed this most sweeping education reform measure ever passed by any state. And with, of course, a, a huge, uh, t the largest tax increase in Kentucky history. And uh, we were all suspicious, I think. And we started reading the legislation. And Cheryl read that legislation. I mean, this was a big bill. She read that thing cover to cover. She knew exactly what was in it. And so she started writing uh, about it and talking about educational progressivism, which was not a term I was familiar with. And, um, and so what we eventually realized out of all this was that um, that this was this was a uh, a bill with very much an agenda, and so uh, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, in in the in, this was in 1989 1990 when you had what was called you know people my age maybe a little younger younger will remember outcomes-based education. That was the, the buzzword at the time, which was just a new label slapped on the same thing that was tried in the late 60s, early 70s with the new math and the open classrooms. Uh, and 25 years before that in the, in the 40s, late 40s and early 50s with the life adjustment movement, the second round of the progressive education movement. And then in the 1920s, the very first round of education. Yeah. Reform what what does that style of education look like in the classroom? I'll paint the picture so that we you know, can yeah. visualize. So, so what progressivism, it, progressivism is based on, on this emphasis in psychology that develops at the end of the 19th century. And you see it in people like Dewey, um, the philosopher William James, um, who basically wanted to, pl to apply psychological principles in the classroom. And so uh, the term child-centered education, this, this has always been sort of the, the clarion call for pro the progressive education movement, that they want to fit education to the child rather than fit the child to anything. I think I said last time we talked that, that they were interested in developing the child, whereas what classical education wanted to do uh, before that um, was to form an adult. And so you have all these psychological principles. And what that developed into, um, for various reasons, was whole word methods of reading instruction, um, methods of math instruction that tried to do away with uh, drill and practice and memorization and those sorts of things. Those are uh, uh, one of the, the things we heard over and over again in the rhetoric that came out of our education reform uh, was um, that 
we want to emphasize higher order skills, not lower order skills. Because they took Bloom's taxonomy of learning where he was just talking about how at the lower levels you do more basic things, you know, uh, lower order skills, memorization, all these things. Or at the higher level, you're in this analysis and creativity. And so the progressive, what the progressives did was, was misinterpret Bloom's taxonomy. And they, they interpreted it as saying that the higher order skills are good and the lower order skills are bad, which was a nonsense. Um, and so I, I, Cheryl and I both read um, the, uh, a book uh, called Educational Wastelands by Arthur Bester. And this guy is the guy who knew what was going on back in the 50s. And we realized it was the same thing going on in Kentucky in the 90s. And so we took a lot of Bester's ideas and we applied it in our situations. So this, this, this became a big, huge fight. Uh, we were saying, look, you, you, this is a back away from basic skills is what you're doing. And this is going to have consequences. I was in public policy at the time. I was getting calls in my office from teachers who fourth grade teachers, I got a whole bunch of calls from fourth grade teachers who were saying, I'm getting kids in from primary school and they don't know their basic math facts. They don't know how to read. They don't, they don't know basic stuff. And the whole emphasis on content knowledge was being sacrificed as well. So on both sides of the arts, uh, science, um, you know, skill content equation, kids were suffering, uh, because knowledge was not important anymore is how you use knowledge. So they weren't teaching them just basic history facts, basic all this stuff. So this is what, this is what was happening. So, uh, I started, I, I, um, my organization at the time came up with standards f that well, was, we, we decided that we were going to fight the standards all the education establishment people who really didn't like it but wouldn't say so were coming to me and say, you need to attack the tests and you need to do all this stuff. And so we came up with alternative standards based on Bill Bennett's, some of Bill Bennett's writings and the Core Knowledge Foundation and all these places, and we published them. Do you remember what any of those standards were? Uh, they were just basic things, you know, algebra, you know, geography. And and so the two state's two largest papers printed our standards – and the state standards side by side, and everyone liked ours. <laughs> so there was a big blowout meeting in the whole every every media outlet where I where I presented those standards to the state uh, some state committee. And uh, from then on, it was a knockdown, drag out battle. I would leave my house in Danville, right in the middle of Kentucky. I'd go to Russellville to do the nine o'clock radio show. I'd go to Hopkinsville to do the noon show, uh, some an other interview in the afternoon, and then a town meeting where hundreds of people would show up in the evening. So we just barnstormed the state, and Cheryl came on a lot of those things, and we created a big problem for them, and they ended up eventually, it didn't all happen at once, but we, we, we won the fight, and in fact, one of the establishment people who was in all the secret meetings on the other side trying to fight us, she came to me one time, she said, uh, I just want to know that, that uh, Bob Sexton, he's deceased now, who is leading the, the fight to, pr to promote these reforms, and it was a lot of promotion, a lot of advertisement. Um, he said, he told me the other day that you all are framing the issue. I mean, we were beating them. We beat them good, you know. So, so it was a lot of fun, too, for, for that cause. But, in, of course, in that process, we are developing our own ideas about what edu— I mean, we know what it shouldn't be, but what should it be? And so we were, we were developing it all that time. During that time, did you ever find yourself in any tense situations that are memorable? Well, okay, so one day uh, I get a call— from the Partnership for Education Reform. Okay, this was a this was an alliance between Humana, UPS, and Ashland Oil, and they were putting a lot of money into promoting these reforms and how great they were, and how this was going to change everything. And uh, of course, they didn't like what we were doing, uh, and so all the everybody, all the people who were anybody in education in the state were members of this. You know, the 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 school administrators association, the school superintendents association, the, the school teachers union, they were all in this group. We got called before them and they wanted to know what our case was. 
And so it was totally Daniel in the lion's den. And I'm, I'm in this room filled with people, and I'm on the hot seat, and I have to answer questions. And, uh, and I, again, I heard back from several people, that you did a great job. You know? So, so we, we were able to articulate our case, and they knew we had a case. Um, and we were just articulating some basic fundamental things about education. Yeah, what were they asking you? I mean, do you remember what the questions were? Well, we had all, I don't even remember now, but, but I mean, we were, we were just able to articulate the importance of basic skills, the importance of teaching knowledge to our children, uh, the importance of not letting tests take over everything. We have that problem today still. Um, high stakes testing was the big buzzword in, in that in that movement. And we said, you can't, you can't take tests that don't even measure knowledge and think that that's going to fix everything. And, you know, so 10 years later, those tests were gone. Uh, and, you know, it took us a while, but we were able to do it. And do you see some of that rhetoric? I mean, still today, you've mentioned that you, that you have, but can you identify where it still exists in maybe Kentucky or just the States broadly? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I was sitting in my chair at home next to the, next to the uh, fireplace where I like to sit, and um, I was reading a newspaper, and it was about some superintendent a few counties away who was talking about, we're going to stop this sit-and-get kind of education, and we're going to start teaching them thinking skills and, and creativity and all this stuff, and I'm sitting there rolling my eyes because this is what we fought, you know, 25 years before that, and, um, and I was sitting there, and my wife was not doing dishes, and, and I said, it's, it's back, and she was washing a big knife and it was a soapy knife. And she turns around with this knife and she said, what is it? You know, I don't read minds, which she tells me all the time. So I said, okay, dear. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what I mean is this, the education reform monster that comes out every 25 years, it's back. Listen to this. And it was the same rhetoric again. And all of a sudden here comes common core and, um, which, you know, uh, and, and Mrs. Lowe, didn't necessarily dislike a lot of what was in the literature standards and the math standards, which are the two things in common core proper. Um, but it's what they, it's what they did with them. It's how they implemented them. It's how the textbook companies changed them. So this, this education reform monster I'm talking about, this, it goes away, it it comes back every 25 years. It's run off by parents and, uh, and, 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 and older teachers with pitchforks and, and torches, you know, back to its lair in teachers colleges. This is where it, it, the, the two worst aspects of our education establishment are the teachers' colleges and the textbook ma- uh, publishers. They're, they're just awful, and the professional standards boards, I should say, because they don't even know what, what education is. They don't know what teaching is, and yet they're uh, putting you through these hoops um, and thinking they're, they're making you a good teacher when they're not. So what do normal people like myself do when these agendas are rising back up? I mean, how do, how do I affect a situation when education reform is starting to make headway in a state or local? Well, I think you just, number one, you need to understand what education truly is so that you can see it's counterfeit. You know, uh, in banking, I was in banking for about six years. Um, when they're trying to teach you about counterfeit money, they don't give you counterfeit money. They give you real money over and over and over again. You learn the feel of it. And then you can identify counterfeit money just, just from the feel of it. Um, you need to be able to identify bad education just from the feel of it. And I think that, um, I think that knowing, knowing what good education is and, uh, knowing how to identify some of the tropes that you, you hear from these education reformers all the time, uh, such as, you know, we need to learn how to use knowledge and, you know, that nonsense. Um, and, and all these other, you know, they're, they're very good with slogans. And, and so, uh, you know, the higher order skills, lower order skills thing. I used to, when I used to go around barnstorming the state, I would have a, uh, this, this image I would put up on a, on an overhead and it would have all these things that they used to say, that they said, you know, the higher order, lower order, the, the, the content, you know, the subject heavy versus the child centered, the, the, but you know, these, these, these dichotomies they like to draw on, but I said, and they're all nodding their heads cause that's what they've heard in their parent teacher uh, meetings, you know, they're all nodding years. And I, I take, I, I, I've, sh- I've put something over the bottom. I take the bottom weights from the 1940s, from a 1940s text from a teacher's college somewhere. Um, you know, so you need to know all those things also because they're just repeated. All you got, you got to just learn four or five things. And that's all you need to know. And they repeat them 
endlessly. So that's your secret. You've only ever known I, five I've things. I've only known five things. That's all I ever <laughs> know. And, and I know how to identify it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so your experience in that was connected to the establishment of the school here or is it the school that you, that you started? Yeah, well, in? it finally came down to, you know, when we, when we saw what it, educational wasn't and we realized what it was, that's when Cheryl became inspired to start a school. And I was actually had started, uh, started a school just a couple of years later of my, of my own that's still there. Um, and, you know, trying to establish classical, you know, we had read the Douglas Wilson book, you know, and so we, we, uh, we tried to uh, establish those schools. And, and as we did it, you know, we, we kind of realized what education was, but we still didn't totally know what it was until we had done it for a while and read further and, and realized that it wasn't just, you know, Dorothy Sayers' three stages of learning. It was, um, it was the great books. Uh, it was the great literature uh, of our civilization, the history, the, uh, all that sort of thing that was important. And so that's what we focused on. You mentioned that she wrote four articles, mm-hmm. I think, that were influential for you. Was it a concerted effort between both of you at that time as you were kind of fighting this? Or? It, she was working with some mothers. There were some mothers who were concerned about this. And, she, and they had their own little group. And, um, and then I was sort of, uh, I was a professional policy person working with the legislature. So it, it was a kind of a convergence, really. We were, we were kind of coming from different, um, different places. And they were effective because they were mothers and they were lobbying the legislature. And I kind of already knew how to do that. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a registered lobbyist to this day. And, um, and, and we were able partly, not only because of the arguments we had, but be, because we had some expertise in actually you know, legislative action. And that's, that's why we had the impact that we did. I don't know if most people who are really passionate about education would know where to start if they started to see legislation coming down the, down the pike mm-hmm. that, that had a, a message that was against what they valued and treasured. How do you start to make change in that? Well, you know, there's, there's, um, there's some tricks there. Um, I knew how to write a press release cause I had done it so many times. Uh, I, I was, uh, on, uh, I was an, an editorial editor on our college newspaper at the university of California. So I knew some tricks, you know, uh, how to write a simple press release, um, how to, how to, um, uh, how to do a sound bite, how to use a metaphor. I had, this is kind of interesting. I had a sheet that it was double sided and I had just written down all the different kinds of things, cooking, mechanics, uh, um, um, airplanes. Um, and I just had these things on. So I would come up with a metaphor. And so when we had, uh, when, when the state had commissioned some experts to, to study its testing system, which was very controversial and we were of course opposed to it. Um, they came out with some very critical, the report came out with some very critical points about it. So I said, I said, uh, this new report has driven a stake through the heart of the test. So a reporter calls me, he says, Oh, uh, vampire metaphors now. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and so just there's little link. And, and again, those are things you, you learn from a classical education is metaphors and the way to state something and to make it, I mean, to, to the point of humor. I mean, there was, there was, um, there was, uh, something I was, uh, I had written a, um, uh, I, I had been lobbying against and writing about and, and I was using the metaphor of, uh, of this thing being dead. This, I, we, I just said, we think this bill is dead because we'd looked at it, we'd counted the votes and it hurt them for us to say that. So we, we, we just declared the bill dead. And so, and then I kept using these death metaphors. And so I, at the end of one press, press release, I put, um, uh, this, this thing is, this thing is deceased. And the further it goes on, the worse the metaphors will get. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and to be able to use sense of humor in this kind of stuff, because, you know, it does get very serious. Yeah. yeah your classical education kind of speaking for itself sure. as you're yeah, lobbying for absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. So we just have a few more minutes left. As you look to the future, do you, what do you think is coming next? I mean, is there anything else in the Commonwealth or just in the state specifically that's, that we need to be aware of? Well, I think Common Course has had its run, um, and I think we're going into a, a, a period where uh, the other the, the the people who push this kind of thing are, are just going to have to reorganize, and it's going to be, you know, probably a, a twenty thirty or something before they come back if the same pattern continues. 
Uh, so I, I don't know if there's going to be another concerted effort because they always get shot down. You know, they always get, get thrown out. But Diane Ravitch talks about this pendulum swing. Diane Ravitch is a, probably the a most prominent historian of, edu- of American education now. And she talks about this pendulum swing where it goes towards the progressive, the, the sort of the educational left, if you will. And, and then it, the pendulum swings back after the reaction of, of a lot of people and parents and older teachers, but it doesn't go back all the way the way it was. And then the next time it comes around, the pendulum swings back again, goes further to the left. And then it goes back to the right again, but not quite as much. So it's this ratchet effect always going toward the progressive in the public schools. And, and that's why I think, you know, a lot of people have just really given up on the public schools and they've realized that, that if, if this is going to be done right, we're going to have to do it. And, and I, I uh, think there's some wisdom to that. Yeah. The hope in starting our own classical schools. Right. And, right. Yeah. right. Right. Well, Martin, it was fun hearing about your experiences there. Thanks for joining us. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Memoria Press podcast. If you like what you heard and you would like to hear more, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel, Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever else you get your podcasts. My name is Shane Saxon, and I'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Memoria Press podcast network, providing a classical Christian perspective on the world of education.